All right, we're going to <clears throat> go through a lot of fun today, and it'll be very helpful concerning general epistles, all right? A lot of people don't understand that. So let's go to Hebrews, and I think we'll start right here first. Hebrews chapter 2, Hebrews chapter 2. Now remember, the author is continuing the, compa the comparison of Jesus Christ being above the angels. Out of all the angelic beings in heaven, Jesus Christ is beyond them. As a matter of fact, he is the Son of God and God himself. That's what the author pointed out. So he's continuing on the study on how much Jesus Christ is superior. All right, let's go to Hebrews 2. Uh, we left off at verse 5, verse 5, Hebrews chapter 2, and we left off at verse 5. The Bible says, For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come whereof we speak. So the author is saying, uh, basically, which of the angels did God put in subjection? Uh, what in subjection? The world to come. Basically, the future world, which is God's kingdom on the earth that he's going to rule. So that's what world to come is. He, the author is saying that this world to come, which we are talking about right now, this future kingdom where God will rule over the world, did he put in subjection to any of these angels in heaven? That's the question. Obviously not. He did it with none of them except Jesus Christ. So the author is trying to point out how much superior Jesus Christ is to the angels. Now, in Hebrews 2.5, this is a verse that you want to mark down. It proves that the writing of the book of Hebrews is not church age doctrine. Again, let me repeat that. It is not church age doctrine. He says right here, uh, the world to come whereof we speak. So he's speaking about the future kingdom that God will bring on the earth. So this is end times. See that? This is future times doctrine. This is tribulation or tribulation saints entering the millennium. That's the kind of doctrine he's talking about. So to dangerously put Hebrews in some form of church age application is wrong. And you got to be careful of that. Now, like I told you, if the author is Paul, you can find many verses in Hebrews that applies to Christian doctrine. And we're going to discover it very soon here. But it is important to understand the background of the author, and I'll show you on the other side of this board later on. The background of this author, recall that uh, he, uh, if it is Paul, he is in Arabia. And he's in Arabia being introduced introduced to Christian doctrine. So he's hearing about it the first time, but he is writing to Hebrews, Jews, and he's writing to Jews about tribulation doctrine. He already said that, the world to come whereof we speak. So he's writing about tribulation doctrine to Jews. The author has every intention to do that. So if there is any verse in here that's church age doctrine, it's being introduced to him. It has a minor role. This is mainly tribulation application, so you want to get that red light on. Remember, general epistles, as I've taught you before, they are double application you want to keep in mind. Each book is case-by-case -case basis, though, on the author's intentions, how much he knew about tribulation doctrine or how much he knew about church age doctrine, etc., etc. Everything is case-by-case. But overall, the gist of all general epistles is church age doctrine and tribulation doctrine. And the reason why, remember, is that during this time period and the connection is one key word, Jew. Jew. It's not Christian church, it's Jew. So because of that, the authors of the general epistles, remember, they're all ministers to the Jews. Paul he would be the only exception with the book of Hebrews, but the title of the book already gave it away, Hebrews. So that's referring to Jews. 
So because of that one word, it's very important to keep in mind that general epistles are not going to be church age doctrine completely. It's going to be Jewish doctrine. It's going to connect to end times, tribulation. If there is church age doctrine, then in Paul's case, he's being introduced to that. And with the other Jewish apostles, it's because they've heard about it from Paul's writings. But remember, Paul's teachings were hard for the Jews to understand. Remember that? It was actually uh, like sacrilegious. It was new. It was extreme to these Jews. You might recall that. Peter even said one time Paul's writings were hard to be understood. Now, I'm not going to go through all the verses on that. I'm just reviewing what I already told you before about the book of Hebrews. And if you have been watching my dispensational studies, I've... I've uh, I've explained so many times about the general epistles having double application. For some people who still don't understand that, I would recommend watching Amazing Dispensational Truth from Genesis to Revelation. If you watch that video, which I taught, it'll be very helpful for you to understand the books of the Bible, how they're divided into, and why general epistles are double application. But later on, I'm going to explain it when I turn over the board to the other side. The point is, Verse 5, keep in mind, he's writing to Jews and there's going to be tribulation doctrine in there. Now verse 6, but one in a certain place testified, saying, what is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? The author says in verse 5 that the angels, he did not, sub, uh, he did not put the world to come under subjection to angels, but in a certain passage, a certain verse in the Bible, it testified, talking about, and the author is trying to point out Jesus Christ here, from humanity's line, not the angelic line. What is man that thou art mindful of him? So who's man that <coughs> God would ever consider or take thought of? They're puny. Or the son of man that thou visitest him. So the son of man, so that's the children of mankind, that God would even visit uh, him. God up in heaven, why would he take time to leave such a powerful, clean position to an incompetent, weak, uh, fallacious world? Why would he even visit that place? So that's a question. Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. So the author is continuing to quote from a scripture passage from verse 6, that God made man a little lower than the angels. They're subservient to angels. So it's amazing the world to come, see, uh, that future world and kingdom is not in subjection to angels, but to humans who are subservient to angels. That's something. And you ever wondered why the angels, are, the fallen angels are mad at you? Why they would follow Lucifer? Why would, they, why would they, they be that dumb and that stupid? Jealousy. Jealousy and envy always drives a person to do stupid things. Right. Now, in verse 7, so I explained that first part, the second part of verse 7, uh, God crowned mankind with glory and honor. So basically he gave him rulership. He gave him rulership that had glory and honor. He gave him a reputation that can control the world. The verse said that God set mankind over God's creation, the works of thy hands. Okay, so as I'm explaining, make sure you're looking at the verse and see if my explanations match with the verse. The point is you understand every single word in that verse. Remember that, okay? All right, so we agree so far. That's the interpretation. Now what passage is our author quoting from? That would be Psalm chapter 8. Psalm chapter 8. So if you look at this drawing over here, the idea is that God gave uh, mankind, see? And obviously that's Adam. It starts from Adam. Mankind, dominion over the world. So mankind here is in charge over everything, even though he's subservient to the angels. So 
Well, that's quite a position. The author is quoting the passage from Psalm 8. Notice in verse 4, for what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. Now, that last part of the verse, thou hast put all things under his feet, is continued when you go back to Hebrews 2, Go back to Hebrews 2. Notice uh, in verse 8, verse 8, Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. So everything in this world, that's the idea, especially the future kingdom, the world to come, it's all under the feet of mankind. So that's a figure of speech, meaning that mankind has the dominance, is above, is in charge over everything in this earth including the world to come. For in that he put all in subjection under him. He left nothing that is not put under him. But so notice right here, God made sure everything in creation is underneath mankind's control. God made sure nothing would not be under mankind's control. Now, Keep your hand here. We're going, to go, we're going to go back and forth. See how my explanations match with the verse. Go to Genesis 1. Genesis 1. There's no doubt Adam was, it, it's t referring to mankind, humans being in charge of God's creation. Go to the book of Genesis chapter 1. That's why mankind is able to play God, see? Use science to play God, dabble with creation. You've got to realize mankind would never have done that if God didn't give them the charge. So they can't do things basically without God's control. They think that they can play God and that they can play with science. They have no idea that the creator of the universe given them charge on those things. Genesis chapter 1 verse 28, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So mankind is in charge of everything in this world and in God's creation. Now, if you look at this chart, however, notice that this dominion of the world is taken over by Satan. That's the reason why Satan wanted to tempt Adam and Eve. Why? To take away that control that mankind has. So even though God gave the control to mankind in the book of Hebrews and Genesis 1, the problem is, is now it's taken over by Satan. So mankind who has any control whatsoever in this world is under the control of Satan. And then in return, under the control of God, obviously, because Satan can't do stuff without God's permission. So that's how it goes now. So mankind is not is not completely in charge of everything in this world because if you look at Hebrews 2, notice the last part of verse 8. But now we see not yet all things put under him. See that? So not everything in this world is put under the feet or the control of mankind. Why is that? Because Satan took it over. Now, uh, keep your hand here. Go to 2 Corinthians 4. <clears throat> And Corinthians 4. Notice that Satan is called the God of this world. So he's in charge of this world, not mankind now. Yes, I mentioned before mankind has a charge over God's work and creation in a sense, though, in a limited scope. That's the problem. The reason why is because Satan has taken it over. That's why Hebrews 2, 8 said, not yet all things put under him. See, there's a limitation. Now go to 2 Corinthians 4, <clears throat> go, verse 4. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them. So Satan is in charge of this world. So he took it over. Now, if we go back to Hebrews 2, verse 9. But we see Jesus. Ah, so the author says, but even though mankind has does not have complete control over the world, we have 
Jesus Christ here. So Jesus Christ, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. Okay, meaning the author saying that when we see Jesus, he is the one who's made a little lower than the angels. We know what that means. That means he became, he took, uh, he was in, uh, man, my brain's not working, okay. He became mankind. He became part of the human race. Because remember, the human race from the previous verse at uh, verse 7 is referring to the uh, mankind, the human race, a little lower than the angels, right? So Jesus took on mankind and then he, be, he became uh, lower than the angels and then suffered and died on the cross. And then he became crowned with glory and honor after that. So Jesus Christ gets, uh, gets the dominion and the control over the world again. By God's grace, he, was, he, took, he tasted death for everybody in this world. That's what verse 9 is saying. So, notice that the wording of verse 9 matched with the wording of verse 7. You notice that there? Why is that? Go to 1 Corinthians 15. Remember, the whole context of Hebrews 2 is talking about mankind, correct? Mankind taking control. But mankind does not have complete control. Yet Jesus Christ, because he goes through mankind, then mankind can completely take over the world again. That's the reason why us human beings, we will rule over the world to come now. So it will, it will return back to our charge because of Jesus Christ. That's the idea. Notice that's why it makes sense. The Bible calls Jesus the last Adam. Why? Because Adam is known as the first man of the human race. And Jesus Christ is the last Adam or the last person that can make up the human race. That's very important. That's why Jesus Christ is called the last Adam, because he had to be the significance for the authors or to God is Jesus Christ had to be part of mankind. It was that crucial. It's that crucial to know. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15, notice that the Bible points out right here. Verse 45, 45, and so it is written, the first man, Adam. So notice right here was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. That's Jesus Christ. So dictating humankind from beginning to end, covering the entire human race, Jesus Christ was able to fulfill that so humankind can take over the world. The devil can't steal it again because of what Jesus Christ did. Now. The thing is, when we go back to Hebrews 2, Hebrews 2, notice, remember, it points out right here, dominion over the world. What? Soon. Soon. So it's important to understand that mankind is not in control over the whole world or kingdom yet. Okay? It's still under the control of Satan. This is evidence against amillennial doctrine which is getting popularized now. They claim that after Jesus Christ died on the cross, he was able to take over the kingdom again. But they claim it's only in a spiritual sense. Now that's not true because notice right here in verse eight, but now we see not yet, uh, but now. See that, that means today. Today in verse eight, but now we see not yet all things put under him. That's important. So. Now, everything right now is not under the control of Jesus Christ or mankind yet. That's the idea. The kingdom is not running right now. That's what the amillennials will want you to believe. That God's kingdom is running right now and it's only a spiritual kingdom. Well, problem is, verse 8, it says, now it's not. 
But the second problem is this is a physical creation of God because the context is obviously verse 7, the works of thy hands, everything God created. That's back at Genesis 1, the physical creation of the world and everything. That's what the author is referring to. It's not referring to a spiritual kingdom. It's a physical kingdom. So God will take over the physical kingdom on the earth, not now, but soon. That's why premillennialism is the correct doctrine. Amen. Not amillennialism, not postmillennialism. Yeah. Premillennialism teaches there's no way mankind can bring in the kingdom themselves. Right. So it's only Jesus Christ. We're doomed to destruction without Jesus Christ. And only Jesus Christ and only Jesus Christ will come down and then set up his kingdom literally on the earth. Ones who do not believe in that are amillennial Calvinists. All right, let's go to Hebrews 2. Hebrews chapter 2. So it is important to understand this. Now, how did Jesus Christ take over the dominion, right? So he had to take it over through suffering, through suffering. So then remember the amillennial mindset and a lot of Calvinists, their mindset is because of Calvary, Jesus Christ became king right now. No, Jesus Christ through the suffering is able to take dominion, but not yet, okay? That's important to understand. It's not yet. All right, let's look at, uh, we're going to look at Hebrews 2 and verse 10. So remember in verse 9, he had to take on death. We already explained that, right? And because of that, he's able to take the dominion for himself through death. But in verse 10, for it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory. So it, 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 it became of Jesus. It is fitting. That's the idea for Jesus Christ, where everything is for him and everything exists because of him. That's the idea by whom are all things. So what is that? A lot of scientists are still baffled and wondering, and I think I mentioned this before in our Hebrew study, they're wondering how everything in the universe consists and holds together. So then they call, they call it gravity. But I'll tell you the, the more correct answer. It's actually God himself. It's Jesus Christ. If there is no God, then this universe cannot exist, hold itself together. Everything will be flying around everywhere. So the only reason why matter, energy, the proton, neutrons, atoms, and everything is consistent and then holding together in place, and it's not all scattered everywhere where the universe cannot hold itself together is because of God. So we're going to look at Colossians uh, 1. Compare this with Colossians 1. Let's go to Colossians chapter 1 and notice that the Bible points out, like our brother said, everything consists because of him. Look at verse 16. 16, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. So notice right here, this is referring to a universal context, all of physical creation. It all consists whole together because of Jesus Christ, all right? Now when we go back to Hebrews 2, Hebrews 2, so everything in the universe that exists fits Jesus Christ, the author says at verse 10. And because of that, he is able to what? bring many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Okay, there's a lot to glean here. So because Jesus Christ has the power where all the universe is only able to exist because of him, that's why he is able to bring many of God's children. We are the sons of God, right? We are the sons into glory, up to glory with him. And this suffering where he was able to die and get many sons to glory, that suffering made him perfect. It made him perfect. And he became known as the captain of their salvation. 
Yeah, that's perfect. He is a captain of their yeah. salvation. Uh, I like to say, I like to mention this, Jesus, Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone, right? Yeah. So the cap stone, cap 10, we can see the matching right here. He is the head. He is always on top. Now, we're going to debunk the Calvinist right here. If I didn't spank them enough tonight. So another thing to spank them on is notice right here that the Calvinists claim that in verse 9, we see an anti-Calvinist uh, we see an anti-Calvinist passage. It says, Jesus died for who? Should taste death for every man, correct? Mm -hmm. So that means he died for all. But Calvinists, they insist, no, that is not correct. They believe in a doctrine called limited atonement. Now, limited atonement, it means that when Jesus Christ atoned for the sins for, of mankind, it was only limited. Out of many Calvinist doctrines, this is one of the most uh, satanic doctrines, all right? This is probably one of the worst doctrines. Uh, you don't dare limit Christ's atonement. Come on. I, I don't even know why they would even title it that way. That's just a, that's just a horrible title. I mean, I mean, you limit God's atonement? I mean, that should be shocking to you. But anyway, they insist that when Versa says he died for all, or he tasted death for every man, he died for the world, that it simply means many. <laughs> so, yeah, I know, they don't, Calvinists are PhD scholars, but they don't know common sense English, all right? So I don't even have to debate uh, theologically Greek or Hebrew with them, we can just move on. But let's just go with the scriptures, okay? All right, we want to go by scriptures and pretend they have some validity when it's not even valid at all. So they insist that all means many because in verse 9, he died for every man. But in verse 10, many sons to glory. See that? So when he died for everyone, that simply means that it was just a lot of people. So many. But it doesn't mean every single human being. Otherwise, every single human being would be saved. That's their logic. Their logic is if God died for everyone, then everyone should be saved. No, the simple answer is God did die for everybody, but it's up to you to take it or reject it. All right, that's the idea. What do you do with the atonement? Do you apply it, see? Do you apply it? Do you accept it or do you push it away? That's the idea. It's like you can make a medicine for every human being that will cure them of their disease, but it's up to you to take it or not. It's that simple, okay? Same thing with anything. When God provides a cure, if anyone provides a cure, it's for everybody. Anybody can take it, but it's up to you to receive it or to reject it. It's that simple. So, uh, now, <clears throat> the reason why we can debunk this is because I crossed it out here. He died for everybody, okay? But not everybody will go to heaven. Why? Many will go to heaven, because, like I said, they receive, they accepted the atonement, Christ. That's what many is referring to. It's that simple. Now go to John 1. That's the evidence. John chapter 1. John 1 shows you the many, actually, who got saved. But the many are those who received him, who applied it, the atonement. Go to the book of John chapter 1. And then we'll look at verse 12. John chapter 1, we'll look at verse 12. But as many as what? Received, received him. him. See? Many. Yes, many get to glory because they received him. Not yeah. because they... Uh, yeah. <laughs> and then God just slams the atonement on them. <laughs> Bam! And oh, I'm an elect. You know, I mean... How do they explain salvation? It's so weird. I mean, how do you get saved? How do you apply it? How do you do it? They don't have an answer. They don't know when they became the elect. That's why some of them will go so far as, well, when I received him for my salvation, yeah, that's when I became the elect, but 
You know, uh, it was not of my own doing. God knew, for, knew that a long time ago. So he made sure that that would happen where he would give me irresistible grace where I cannot resist it and that I can receive it. And it was predestinated before the foundation of the world. And because of that, I hence the limited atonement applies because I am the many who are not the all. How many of you just got confused and want to give up your Christianity after that? You know what that is? That's bogus theology. That is bogus theology. It's a fancy term for scholarship in Christian terminologies. I want Bible. Give me Bible. All right? Now, when you go to... Uh, so, notice right here, John 1, 12, but as many as received him. So, if you received it, not being a Calvinist and just stay still and the Lord elected you before... No, no, no. You have to receive it. To them gave ye power to become the what? Sons of God. Sons of God. Right. Remember, many sons to glory, right? Yeah. How do you become the many sons to glory? You receive it, duh. <laughs> now, it, it, can it get deeper and more lost than that? It's not hard, okay? This is one plus one equals two, all right? The Calvinists make it complicated by taking that plus sign and then switch it to an X and they think it's one times one equals one or something like that. All right? They like to complicate things. Now, this is pretty simple. Now, go back to Hebrews. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 2. Now, this is something important to learn about the word perfect that I want you to understand. Now, remember, like I mentioned to you before at verse 10, that Jesus Christ was perfected through suffering. So, if we go back over here, all right, I'm going to have to go back and forth. Look at this. So remember, Jesus Christ, uh, the reason why he was in that human line that was able to take over the world and humans can take over the world again is because through sufferings. So Satan took it over from mankind, but Jesus took it back again through his sufferings. This sufferings is what perfected him. Now, if we go to this side of the board over here, it's important to understand we know that Jesus is sinless. He never sinned, correct? Amen. Yeah, Jesus never sinned. But the verse pointed out he had to be perfected. See that? What does that mean? Does that mean that Jesus sinned before? No. Jesus is sinless, but it doesn't mean the same as being perfect. So, this is important to understand. When you look at that word perfect in your Bible, you need to know two different definitions here. We've learned something here. Perfect does not mean sinless. That's the bottom line. Perfect does not mean sinless. So people are going to pull up verses in the Bible and then it's going to be hard to understand after that. Why does the Bible say to be holy or be perfect as your Father in heaven, which is perfect, right? That's impossible. None of us could be sinless. But the idea of that is, number one, it's just striving for perfection. That's the idea. It's striving for, for perfection. Number two, it's pointing out when the word perfect is used, is, uh, I think it's pretty much the same thing, striving for perfection. Because when we compare that, it'll be the same thing. It means to com be complete. It means to be complete. That's the second definition. But I think these two kind of go hand in hand. The greatest evidence is what we've learned in our previous Pauline epistle, Philippians 3. Let's go back there. Did you forget Philippians 3? We had a good study on this one. I don't know if you recall this. Go to Philippians 3. Now, Paul, notice he points out right here that we are perfect in Jesus Christ but we're still striving for perfection. Yeah. Pointing out that, yes, we're saved Christians, we're perfected, but there's still some stuff that we need to complete. So we're not in fullness, we're not in completeness. All right, go to Philippians chapter three. <clears throat> Notice in verse 12, 12. Not as though I had already attained, mm -hmm. either were already what? Perfect. So he's admitting he's not perfect, but he's striving for perfection. See that? But I follow after, if I, I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. 
And then notice right here at verse 15, let us therefore as many as, what? Be perfect, be thus minded. But we are already perfect. So see, that's why you have to understand this. Perfect is not the idea of being sinless. That would make a lot of sense. The idea is when he says, I am perfect, you could guess that this will have to do with salvation. I, uh, I am perfected in salvation in Jesus Christ. But I'm still trying to perfect myself in my daily works, in my daily living for him. So it's important to understand this definition of perfection or completeness, like Paul said, right? There's still some unfinished business. So remember, perfection, if you keep these two definitions in mind, it'll be very helpful for you when you read the other verses and you won't get confused. Remember, perfect does not mean sinless. If you have that, you'll get confused. Perfect is one, completeness. Number two, it's striving for perfection, striving for holiness, striving for sinlessness. That's the idea. Okay, so when God says, be holy for I am holy, he's not telling you, you to be, you know, a sinless because we've already sinned, but he wants you nevertheless strive for that. Okay, let's go back to Hebrews 2. That was an important study. Go to Hebrews 2. Now, let me explain Jesus Christ here, why he had to be perfected through death. Because of Hebrews chapter 5. All right, keep your hand at Hebrews 2. Go to Hebrews 5. Verse 8. Though he were a son, Jesus Christ, yet, notice right here, learned he obedience by the things which he suffered and being made perfect. See that? So it didn't mean that Jesus Christ sinned, but uh, he had to be perfected. Why? Remember, perfect means completeness, right? That means something is missing here. So what are some missing things? Even though Jesus is sinless, he need to learn obedience through suffering. That's important. It's easy to say Jesus Christ can obey the Father, but it's another thing if he were to suffer. Yeah. Yeah. When he suffers, that true obedience can expose itself. Yeah. The experience. It's one thing to say, so suffering due to, this is important, experience. It's one, uh, how many times we know this, all right? It's one thing to say, I know how to witness to people, but it's another thing to actually do it. Yeah. Right? You can get all that in your head, but until you actually do it, then you learned it through experience. Yeah. It's one thing to just have it in your mind, oh, I love the brother, but then when you're actually in suffering with the brethren, or if the brethren mistreat you, etc., unless you experience real life things, it shows whether you love the brother or not. So that is very important to understand. Experience is important. Because think about this. Don't you think the devil, <clears throat> he could try to tempt God where God says, no, I love my people, and then... The devil says, no, you don't really love them because you've never been like one of them. You never experienced pain like they did. You never went through sinful struggles like they did. See that? Think about this. Guys, you got to think about this. If we're going to prove the love of God, the only place where we could prove it from is Calvary. If you go to Old Testament about his love, I mean, you might as well be atheist. You would think that, no, God don't really love us. Why? Because we human beings demand proof. Right. We want proof that he actually loves us. Now, don't you think that God demands the same proof as well? And mankind whine and complain, why can't God just make us love him? No, he wants proof of that. Yeah. So that's why he put that forbidden tree in there. Because he wants actual test and experience if you really love me or not. So before mankind blames God about he doesn't really love them. Don't blame God when he was testing you and demanding proof from you in return about loving him. That's real good stuff. Yeah, amen. All right, say that to an atheist and park it right there. Spoil rotten, stupid human beings who cry and whine about everything and blame God. That's a problem with us human beings. If, why don't you be in God's shoes for once rather than being in your own shoes, you selfish, liberal-minded, spoiled victim you. Always doing that all the time. 
Poor you, poor me. Everybody doesn't care about me. Why don't you think about my feelings? Get off yourself. That's sin. That's wickedness there. All right. Now, when we go to uh, Hebrews chapter 2, and then verse 11, verse 11. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. So the author is saying that Jesus Christ who sanctified and the people who are sanctified by Jesus Christ, both of them are all one. Now, we already know that. That's the body of Christ, obviously. All of us are one together. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. So because of this, Jesus is not ashamed to call us his family. Man, that's a wonderful thing, his brothers. And that's a wonderful thing, man. Wow. How about that? Being in the family of God. Verse 12, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. So Jesus Christ is saying, I'm going to, to uh, declare your name, God, to my family, to, my, to the humans here who are saved. My brothers, in the middle of the church, I'm going to do it. And that's why I'm going to sing praise to you. So that's why we have things like this today in church. We have, it like, uh, we have things like this today in church. Now, I know uh, some of you are probably thinking this. All right, so let me switch the board here. And this is going to be important. All right. All right. All right. A little bit more right or left or? Good. Okay. Now, here's the fun part. You ready? Don't you see right here how much this can apply to us? You notice that, right? Uh, 10, 11, 12, especially since it says church, right? Uh, wait a minute. I thought this was for Jews. Tribulation. See that? That's why I mentioned double application. You're going to have to have the Christian application in mind as well. It goes back and forth. Now, I know what's in everybody's mind, all right? What's in everybody's mind is, I don't get it. How is the author writing to, you know, back and forth like this? Wouldn't it be easier if he said, this is for Jews, and this part is for Christians. It don't really work like that. So let me rewind and remind you from our first Hebrews class. When we rewind, remember the authors don't know everything completely. That is indisputable with previous passages in the Bible. When authors are proclaiming the word of God, they don't have all these dispensational timelines in mind. A lot of times, they don't know uh, everything completely until the full Bible was re written and then you see everything. For example, Isaiah, when he, uh, the psalmist, when he write about, they pierced my hands and my feet, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He didn't know that doctrinally, prophetically, that would be about Jesus Christ. He's historically writing about his woes, his sorrows. But then again, maybe he was prophesying about Christ. But we don't know what was going on in the author's minds when they were writing. That's important to understand. Right. We even debate about previous authors and their literary works or preachers and teachers from, uh, from their previous books, what they really meant when they said that. See, that happens. So, it's, so you have to understand that we won't know the minds of the authors completely. But what's important is to take their works and then find the right meaning. A lot of people are trying to figure out what was the author thinking when he wrote it. No, we don't know what the psalmist was thinking when he said that. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Maybe he was prophesying about Jesus Christ. Maybe he was talking about his woe and sour. Or maybe it was both. You don't know. But that's how scripture always works. We know that. We know that. Prophets don't see everything into the future. They only see little, uh, it's called mountain peaks of prophecy, like Larkin drew out. They only see little bits and pieces of the prophecy. But those who have the entire Bible, they can look at every little prophecy that every prophet had, connect all those pieces together, and they see the bigger picture. Does that make any sense? So, 
understanding that, let's do this, okay? Let's uh, go through this one by one. So remember, we also have to look case by case with every general epistle, like I taught you in the previous uh, Hebrews lesson. Because every author and the timeline they're in when they're writing the general epistle is all different, okay? I mentioned that to you before. Because the author of Hebrews is going to be the author, different from the author of 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. Why? Because John already knows a lot of Pauline epistles, and John was long after the Apostle Paul. He wrote the last book, Revelation, right? That's different from the author of Hebrews, who is writing, you know, before the Pauline revelation, before Pauline Christian doctrine. And he was talking about Jews in the tribulation. So see, you have to take case by case with every general epistle. That way you can see, if you understand the background first, then you can understand the author's intention. All right? So people are trying to figure out what the author was thinking. Like I told you, we will never know. But I'll give you three possibilities of what's going on. And I guarantee, I'm pretty sure there's more possibilities. Because I don't really know what's in the author's mind. So, as he's writing this Hebrews, let me say it this way, <clears throat> one by one. The author's background, we suppose it's Paul in Arabia writing to Hebrews about tribulation doctrine. Remember, he's a Jew of the Jews, and he ministered to Jews at the beginning, too. You might recall, after he got saved, he was preaching to those Jews in the temple. He almost got killed, though, so they had to get him away. So... He's writing to Hebrews about tribulation doctrine. So this is not Gentiles, see that? This is not Christian doctrine. But in Arabia, we know that God was introducing him to Christian doctrine. It took him a while, actually. So if he's writing the book of Hebrews, it would make sense when he's writing to Jews about tribulation doctrine, there's some inklings there of Christian doctrine. That would make a lot of sense because he's learning that in Arabia. Okay, so that would explain why the book of Hebrews has inklings of Christian doctrine, but overall, it is a uh, Jewish doctrine applied for tribulation. Do we understand so far? Okay, understanding that. Now, this is eye-opening. In the Bible, you have three applications, but I'm going to cover two, which will be very helpful. Everyone concentrates on the historical. That's a mistake, all right? The historical interpretation is basically applied to their timeline, all right? So the writer, uh, come on, come on, come on, come on. Writer is writing, so that's what writing means, that symbol, okay? That emoji means writing, okay? That writer is writing about his timeline. The book of Psalm. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? They pierced my hands and my feet. Right? So the psalmist, if he's writing in his timeline right here, then he's writing about how God forsook him and how he's going through so much suffering it feels like his hands and feet are pierced. But God... Notice right here, the author is not just man, it's God. To be honest, God's the ultimate author here. So when you look at the author, remember there's two groups. It's, it's the actual writer, all right, and God. Now God, while he's letting the writer write what he wants, he says, you can write about that historically, but I see a doctrinal thing right here. Doctrinally, prophetically, it is something to the future. So this writing is applied to something in the future that will fulfill something, that can fulfill prophecy. It is a doctrinal truth that is not in the timeline in the author's timeline, but somebody else's timeline. Now, how do people know that? I mean, the psalmist, think about it. When he's writing that, how would he know that this would have application to Jesus the Messiah dying on the cross? 
he don't. The ones who do are those who read that passage or those who read the Bible. If they have the writings before and they compare it with other writings in the scripture, they're able to see the fuller picture. And they go, oh, I see right here, this is a fulfillment of Jesus Christ being crucified. Not just the psalmist going through a hard time. See that? So, the author doesn't have to know. It's not, that's not the importance God is looking at. It's the person reading the Bible. Uh, it's the Bible reader or the Bible student. That's a better to do it. The Bible student. Bible student sees it, not writer. You might say, oh, you, that, that's pretty arrogant that you know more than the author. You know, you're not the author writing that one. No, 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 no. I mean, that's scripture. Psalm 22, for example. Not only that, many other messianic prophecies. Not only that, many other prophecies. Not only that, the prophets even admit they don't know everything. Yeah. <laughs> the ones who know are the ones who have the whole Bible in their hand. Do you think the psalmist had that? No. So it's important to keep that in mind too. Hebrews is fresh. It's being written out, right? The author won't see the full picture, but those who have Hebrews, James, Revelation, and the Pauline epistles after that, we're able to see the bigger picture and go, oh, okay, this is what the author didn't see, but I'm seeing something else. So that is indisputable. All right, that is indisputable fact that I'm pretty sure all denominations can agree with with Bible verses. They have to, all right? They all only concentrate a historical interpretation. If you do that, you will dismantle and get rid of prophecy. That's important to understand. You will get rid of doctrine. That's important to understand. It's not just a historical context. You have to look at the, the verse that can have a doctrinal prophetic application. It can apply something to the future that will fulfill prophecy and only the Bible student will see it, not the writer, because they have the whole Bible. Now, these are two indisputable facts. Can we all agree with that? Yep. All right. It's two lenses here. It's the writer who sees it in his timeline or his perspective. So maybe not just his timeline, but also his perspective. All right, maybe he's seeing a different timeline too, but it's not the way that the Bible student would see it, okay? All right, so understanding that, now look how this will work, okay? This is going to make sense. Hebrews is here, okay? So that's why I did all this code wording here, okay? So. Pretend this is verse 1, verse 2, verse 3, and this is the book of Hebrews, okay? So remember, the background of the author is he's writing to Hebrews about tribulation doctrine while being introduced to Christian doctrine, okay? So he's writing all of this. Now, what was going on in his mind, okay? There are only three things I can think about, but I'm pretty sure there are more, okay? Number one, due to the transitional period which is the early book of Acts. Now remember, Paul was in that time writing Hebrews, right? Yes. So this is before Pauline Gospel, uh, Pauline Revelation, uh, the books of Romans to Philemon, Christian doctrine, okay? So he was at that time where the writer is expecting the rapture and tribulation. Now we've seen verses like that, right? We've seen verses, we can say, okay, that's tribulation Jew, that's easy. Tribulation Jew, tribulation Jew. Why? Because the author is expecting that. Now, this is where it gets tricky, is two and three, okay? So number two, the writer thinks it is all tribulation doctrine. So when he's writing Hebrews, he's thinking historically, like the psalmist, historically, that it's about his timeline. So the writer is probably thinking about his timeline that, hey, this is for Hebrew Jews and we're anticipating the rapture and tribulation. But God, who's the author, he instead sees it as Christian. So while the, while the writer of Hebrews is thinking this is tribulation, God could see it. No, no, no. It's actually 
sometime in the future, it's going to fulfill the prophecy about the Christian church, but you just don't know it yet. I'm introducing you, Paul, about the body of Christ, that mystery of the church, Gentiles coming in. This is still new to you. You have yet to see that. So I see the fuller picture, whereas you're not, Paul. See? So it could be that way. Just like the psalmist, right? He's writing historically about his woes, his sufferings, but God is seeing it where it is, no, it's a future prophecy of Jesus and Messiah suffering through your line, David, through your sufferings, see? All right, now number three. This is important. The writer thinks it is all tribulation doctrine, but God applies to Christians too. So in other words, this is eye-opening. Listen, it is possible that the writer, he's writing everything to tribulation doctrine, and God says, yes, it can apply to tribulation Jews. But, I, but those same verses can also apply to Christians as well. Yeah. So here's an example, all right? Here's a verse that can apply to tribulation Jew and Christian church. You ready? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, does that verse only apply to tribulation Jews, or would you say it applies to you too? Yeah, see, so that verse works. See, that, that verse works with both groups of people. So the verses in Hebrews, it works for tribulation, but it can also work for Christian. Does that make any sense? Now, these are the only three that I can think about. Now, uh, some people, they might get some kind of smart aleck uh, arguments or uh, questions like, well, it doesn't make sense if the writer was writing all tribulation doctrine, then if the people receive that uh, epistle and it was tribulation doctrine, how are they going to realize this is for Christian church when the author intended it for tribulation doctrine for Jews? Wouldn't the recipient take it as tribulation doctrine for Jews? Well, it's the same thing with the psalmist, see? Same thing with the psalmist. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? They pierce my hands and my feet. The Jews at time, the recipients who took that would take it as David woe and sorrow. But when more books of the Bible are written out and they get the full Bible, and if you're a student of the Bible, not just reading the verse from the author, if you look at the cumulative scriptures that match up with the verse, then you know, oh, that's Jesus Christ's death on the cross, not just David going through a hard time. See, so remember, like I told you before, is that until you get the whole Bible in your hand, then you're going to recognize that this is going to be a church age doctrine from the book of Hebrews. Now, why is that important? Because there are two heretical groups, okay? And neither of them are dispensationalists. They're called anti-dispensationalists yeah. and they're called hyper-dispensationalists, all right? So hyper-dispensationalists harp on dispensationalists so much that they hyper-divide it, but they are not really rightly dividing. We divide more than they do on verses. Didn't you know that? You might say, how so? Notice one, two, and three. Whatever's going on in the author's mind, it could be all three for all we know. And this is how the verses are going to be divided like that. See that? Yeah. So notice right here, this entire book of Hebrews, maybe this first half of verse one, he was thinking about the rapture and tribulation to happen. But the second half over here, maybe he was thinking it's all tribulation doctrine, but God sees that second half as for Christian. See that in verse two? The uh, author might think that it's all tribulation doctrine, but God sees it as Christian. But the second half right here, God might think that, oh no, actually the second half, it can work for both tribulation and Christian. See that? So what's that called? That's called rightly dividing the word of truth. See, we, we are more hyper than the hyper dispensationalists. We divide things more. The, you know what the problem with anti-dispensational, hyper-dispensationalists are? They're one application mindset. Yeah. So hyper-dispensationalists insist the book of Hebrews is all tribulation Jew. So then they take away Christian doctrines about the new birth, believe it or not, and apply it to tribulation yeah. or Jews. They take it away from Christians. And then... Uh, there are anti-dispensationalists who will claim, no, this is for Christian Jews, they would call it. Christian Hebrews, when the author never said Christian Hebrews, he just said Hebrews and end times. But anti-dispensationalists would, would insist that. And that's why there are verses that talk about losing salvation. That contradict Pauline epistles about salvation by grace through faith. So, 
it makes more sense. Uh, plus, the verse also said end times anyway. It, said it talked about tribulation and Jews. So how can it be plainer than that? So I don't know who's dumber, the hyper or the anti, okay? So I don't know who, all right? But the point is, as Bible-believing dispensationalists, we believe that a double application is the right method for general epistles, but not just general epistles, any book of the Bible. You have to have multiple applications. And I've proven that in other dispensational studies. All right, Psalm 22 is a great example. You see a historical application about the psalmist talking about his suffering, and then you see uh, another application where it's doctrinal prophetic about the Messiah dying. So there's no doubt you have to have a double application or triple application at times in the Bible. It happens, and it can happen in the middle of a verse. Middle of a verse. There are plenty of verses on that one. All right. Uh, hopefully that's been very eye-opening and helpful. And then what I'll do in our next Hebrews class is show you the church age application of these following verses. All right. So I will show you the church age application and possibly the tribulation application if God sees it that way. See, so we might do that too. Heavenly Father, I pray that tonight's teaching has been a blessing to the hearers, opened our eyes more to the scriptures and to understanding your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.